Costa said he had a hangover and was possibly drunk the night he fought Adesanya. What happens to the mentality of an undefeated fighter when they fall short for the first time? Something happened before the fight. I'm not excused here to my, my people, my fans. This is the story of Paulo Costa, his rise, his fall, and all the violence in between. Since his greatest two middleweights in the world at present, Paulo Costa and Israel Adesanya, some early leg attacks. Algumas coisas aconteceram. Eu não vou nomi nominar o que aconteceu exatamente. Não vou nominar tudo que aconteceu. Foram alguns fatores que foram é, fundamentais. É, Comecei com por volta de 12 para 13 anos de idade. Eu sou um cara que busca muita luta. A 3-0 Brazilian prospect, hair dyed blonde, physique shredded, gained his spot on the Ultimate Fighter Season 3 by defeating Jose Roberto in the second round by guillotine submission. He was then picked as the second seed for Team Silver's middleweight squad. For such an inexperienced fighter, only a year and a half into his career and three fights under his belt, to have not only garnered the attention of the UFC so early on, but also claim a spot in the gauntlet that the Ultimate Fighter provides, was nothing short of spectacular. But if you were to ask the man himself, he would more than confidently tell you that he was destined to be here, something he would profess from the moment cameras were shoved in front of his face. Eu fiz a entrevista, falei, falei que eu sou mesmo. É a minha proposta de vir Despite self-assurance, life always has a funny way of developing us into our best selves. Costa's immaturity and freshness in the sport would become apparent in his second fight. He would come out looking for blood in the first round, and there was no surprise why. Up until this point, he had always gotten his way in the cage, finishing every fight in spectacular fashion. That undefeated hot-headedness and lack of resistance by his opponents would serve to backfire when the resilience of his opponent would weather the storm and drag Costa into deep waters, smothering him and exhausting him. Costa would lose via a gruelling split decision. Slumped on the floor and spent, Costa's time on the show would come to an end. The title of Ultimate Fighter and the opportunity of becoming a world champion had eluded him. Costa would head back to Brazil with the first bitter taste of defeat in his mouth. But if there was one thing for sure, his mentality was not broken. See, for Costa, a place of hardship, of pain, of setbacks, was a place that he knew well. Whilst an initial thought might be that Brazilian Costa would be born into poverty like so many of our favourite Brazilian fighters, it was not the case for him and his family. Costa was born and raised in the beautiful city of Belo Horizonte, a place known for its low crime rates, friendly community, but most importantly its thriving businesses. Costa was well educated and his mother confessed that he enjoyed the finer things in life. Although Costa was admittedly a troublemaker, getting into fights and being a nuisance at school, he still felt that he was destined for great things. It's just, the avenue for achieving that had not revealed itself to him yet. Costa would find jiu-jitsu at age 15, a suggestion from his brother, and his raw talent was noticed by everyone in the gym. But life would deal Costa a blow that scares many of us. His father and mentor would pass away from throat cancer just a few days after Costa's 17th birthday. Not only did it financially wreck the family, but it would emotionally torment Costa, as the person that had guided him into a man would fall to such grim circumstances. And in Respect for Costa, it is this very tragedy that would lead him to become hungrier than ever for a life of what he perceived to be destined greatness. In the depths of anguish, his faith would show him a light that would guide him to the very doors of the Ultimate Fighter penthouse. But the rest, as we know, did not go to plan, despite how well it seemingly lined up. Por decisão dividida, Lioto, que garante sua vaga na semifinal do Tufo Brasil 3. 
After failing to make it into the UFC after the Ultimate Fighter show, Costa's brother would lament, it just wasn't our time yet. And the UFC's official reasoning certainly cemented that thought, stating that Costa, with only a 3-0 record, was far too inexperienced to compete in the premier organisation of the sport. But Costa was undeterred and felt that he was graced by a divine force, one that would push him towards greatness and ultimately towards his true ambition of snatching the UFC middleweight title. Just a couple months after his experience on the Ultimate Fighter, Costa would put in motion a devastating win streak through the middleweight division of Brazil. It wasn't about money, it wasn't about a claim. It was about one thing and one thing only, sending a message to the UFC, letting them know that despite his lack of experience, he was destined for the top. By the end of 2016, the Eraser had earned himself two middleweight titles on the regional scene of Brazil and was now the owner of an 8-0 record, all by way of finish. Costa's manager would receive an offer from Ryzen Fighting Federation, one of the leading organisations in the East. They wanted him to make his debut in Japan in December of 2016. Costa agreed to it, moved to a different city and invested everything he had to prepare for his first international bout. The camp was long and arduous, as Costa put everything on the line to manifest that performance of a lifetime. Time. The coaches, food, equipment and supplements took everything from Costa, but that didn't matter. Costa was on a crash course to the UFC, and this first big step up in terms of promotion was the place to make a statement. But the fight fell through. I came back home, completely broke, Costa said. I had no money, but when it's our destiny, a path God plans for us, it will eventually happen. Costa's fierce belief in the fact that he was destined for so much more was simply undeniable. And despite pushback from the universe at every single opportunity, Costa's faith would stimulate fate. A few weeks after returning to Brazil penniless, he would receive a call from none other than Dana White. He was in the UFC. A fucking eraser, dude. That guy's scary. I've never met a human being who is more of a an animal, an actual animal than Paulo Costa. Because that's all he does is train. He goes, this guy doesn't party, he doesn't fuck around, he's just concentrating on measuring his food and training. And he says he wants to call you the eraser. I, I erase everybody, like, like this. <laughs> And the fight was basically an assault. You would never believe that Johnny Hendricks was a former world champion if you saw the way the eraser beat the shit out of him. In just over a year, Costa had strung together four wins in the UFC, all finishes, against the likes of UFC veteran Uriah Hall and former welterweight champion Johnny Hendricks. He was a destructive force, and his initial run had proven that he was indeed worthy of not only being in the UFC, but also belonging in the top echelon of the sport. Costa's fight with Romero was one of the most wild, entertaining and destructive fights the Octagon had ever been graced with, and even still, years later, it is one of the best fights I'm sure fight fans have ever seen. It lived up to every expectation a pure, unfettered symphony of violence splayed onto the canvas. Romero, that terrifying facade that haunts the octagon, was finally matched by an equally undeterred challenger. And even though the decision could have gone either way, the true winners that night were the fans. Costa had extended his record to a perfect 13-0, and had quite rightly in devastating form set himself up for a title shot against the ruling middleweight champion Israel Adesanya, another undefeated combatant that was creating a legacy of equally exceptional quality. Their fight together promised to deliver one thing, a clash of destinies as two men convinced that their potential is guided by ethereal forces, attempt to prove whose self-assured success was the truth. Costa would head into fight week with an unmatched belief that this was his moment, an event heaven sent to achieve his ultimate goal. You can see how focused, how much determination, faith, 
Paulo Costa de Razer is gonna be the next UFC champion. They're both undefeated. What does it mean for a champion to defeat an undefeated contender and vice versa for the contender to be an undefeated champion? Yeah, that's what I said when we opened. It's, it's, it's the, couldn't ask for anything more if you're a fight fan. If you love watching fights, this is the type of fight you want to watch right here. Thank you all for being here. We are now ready to go. It is the way in for UFC 253, Adesanya versus Costa. 185, the official weight for Paulo Costa. 184 pounds, the official weight for the champion, Israel Adesanya. It's time! But at some point, there's a beautiful body kick. There's another one. Oh, left hand switch stance there from Adesanya. Oh! This is not looking good for Paulo Costa. He's getting picked apart here in this fight. I guess Costa wasn't this or that. No, Costa is. Costa is that good, and, and he's, he's a savage and normally, but uh, Adesanya shut him down tonight and absolutely put on a clinic and destroyed him. I just sat there going, holy shit. And then, and then obviously, um, you know, Adesanya just went to work, picked him apart piece by piece, made it look really easy. Defeat is often a place that changes competitors irrevocably. They almost lose a part of themselves to the game. And whilst fighters often fall short at less pivotal moments in their careers, learning valuable lessons early on, Costa had strung together an impressive, undefeated professional career. And so losing at a point so close to destiny is not just a setback, it's obliteration, both egotistically and athletically. Not only that, the salt would be rubbed deeper into the wound by Israel Adesanya's divisive personality. And as serious as I often like to be, there is no way you you can describe earnestly a full grown male world champion, proceed to dry hump, narrow to run, and break dance at his opponent's expense after victory. And so to be on the receiving end of one of the pettiest celebrations this sport has to offer, it's no wonder that the Costa we got back had developed some fissures. Upon finding out what Israel had done, Costa would turn to social media to voice his discontent. The human trash did after a fight. I didn't see when I was there on the cage, but I saw now. I disapprove 100%. He would also allude to a problem that had transpired the night before his pivotal fight. Something happened before the fight. I'm not excused here to my, my people, my fans, but I will be 100% to fight him and to make him pay. That's my words. It would turn out that Costa was unable to sleep and would in desperation turn to drinking a bottle of wine in order to get to sleep. Whatever the reason for his restlessness and health issues, the fact was he had, in the moment that required pure dedication, strayed from the path and consequently sabotaged his own potential success. Israel and fight fans would perceive Costa's antics post-loss as a downward trend into delusion, the product of an ego shattered, a sentiment supported by Costa's first fight back from defeat almost a year later. He would be paired up against another opponent that had just lost to Israel, Marvin Vittori, but fight week would prove to conjure up a very strange set of events. It was reported that Costa had shown up to fight week of their scheduled bout almost 30 pounds over the middleweight limit, and just two days before he was meant to make weight, he had made no efforts towards stripping away the pounds required for the fight to remain on the card. In his media scrum, he was calling for a catchweight fight, much to the surprise of Marvin Vittori. Catweight, 185, I don't know, I don't know. I think uh, make this fight on 185 could, could be more excited to, to the fans. In what is perhaps one of the greatest moments to bless the small screen, we would see negotiations for a catchweight fight play out on ESPN with Brett Okamoto. For, for, for him, like, how how is that even possible that, like, you know, we're supposed to fight a 185 and he comes in a week out, you come in a week out over 215 pounds. When I, I came, hey, Mavi, when I came to fight, I came heavy, always came heavy to fight. Uh, you have a problem with that? 
The funniest part was that Costa seemed to put the blame on Vittori, suggesting that he was too scared to take the fight at a heavier weight, and that Costa's own weight was Marvin's problem, not his. I have no problem with weight. If you have a problem, okay, I can understand you. You know, he's not so confident. But I, I, listen, I, I'll... In some strange agreement, they would both weigh in at 205 pounds and ultimately step foot in the octagon, despite the obscure build-up. Costa would lose his second fight in a row, and it was really no surprise, considering his total disregard for the sport before the bout. That lack of professionalism, the disrespect towards his opponent, and the UFC had quite rightly annoyed Dana White, who proceeded to bar Costa from ever fighting at middleweight again. Yeah, we absolutely tell you where to fight when this happens, yeah. He's, he's gonna have to fight at 205. Yeah. The discussion quickly after the fight could be boiled down to the fact that perhaps Izzy had stolen that fire from Costa, and to be honest, there seemed to be a lot of truth in that sentiment. Before his loss, Costa had a clear path laid out before him, an undefeated, untested rise to the UFC Championship, his faith supporting the fact that this was indeed his destiny. But that bitterness that life provides would leave an empty chasm following defeat, an aimless meander through the desert, attempting to realign with some form of goal. And after all, what was left for Costa? Stringing win after win against the elite at middleweight, making a gruelling and draining cut with a slight possibility that he might get a rematch. Uncertainty can certainly provide a downfall, and so for me, it is no surprise that he came in overweight. Costa was lost, broken in defeat, unmotivated and aimless, his life's dreams dashed against the rocks. But in turmoil, we got to see the rise of something far more special. Not the Costa we deserved, but the Costa we needed. If my English speaking was good, actually, I'd like to seat at same table with some icons and references to me like Tony Ferguson, Alex Jones, Diaz Bros, Joshua Fabia, Eddie Bravo. No alcohol, no drugs, just free thoughts. What about this guy? Too much gay. <laughs> oh my oh. god. Wow. <laughs> This is... <laughs> Guys, everybody knows the skinny clown humped me nine months ago. Now I having baby end of June. I only asking people respect my time while I become new mother. Please UFC, stop sending contract until after baby birth. Stylebender, I see you in New Zealand court for to support baby you father. Thanks you fans for support. I am rich and smooth brain with a powerful Brazilian body that has been aged for 31 years. This is wicked gold. Costa may have fallen short in the fight game, but if anything can be said for the Brazilian, the last few years of his social media present has made him somewhat of a national treasure in the eyes of fight fans. What do you make of the fact that Paulo Costa has become like this darling now? I follow him on Twitter, bro. Don't tell him. I don't want him to block me. God. But if I find him, he's funny, crazy. I mean, he's, he's actually kind of funny. Yeah. At How first, it was kind of cringy, <laughs> I think. But then I was finding it funny because you know you kind of know the person after you fight them. But then seeing the way he just leans into it and the whole thing with you side out fuck you side uh i like this juice. Funny. yeah all this stuff <laughs> he's <juice>. actually hilarious <laughs> he was on the show and he cut someone's hair in the back there no new york rick yeah i remember the discourse post losing to adesanya and fans were not exactly very compassionate after finding out he had drunk a bottle of wine now those very same people who more than likely roasted him follow him on twitter he had somewhat single-handedly over the course of a couple years turned around public perception of himself through the power of secret juice memes and bizarre tweets the popularity he has garnered with his outlandish sense of humor has not only made him more favorable in the eyes of fight fans but also the ufc who obviously track engagement on their fighters across social media, giving him a more powerful position to negotiate from, something we will come to shortly. All I know is, I'm around for the ride, and I'm sure you all are too, and I couldn't possibly make this video without mentioning any of this. So if you want to be entertained almost daily, follow this man on all social medias linked in the description. So let's get back to where we left off, the loss to Marvin. Almost a year later, Costa would be scheduled to return to the Octagon against former middleweight champion Luke Rockhold in a bout that would promise violence. Although since losing his title, Rockhold had had a tough road, losing back-to-back -back vicious KOs against both Yoel Romero and Jan Blahovic. He had spent three years out of the fight game, his return pushed back for various reasons. But in truth, the longer he had spent out of the ring, the better, giving time to improve, refocus, and for his brain and chin to heal, especially considering he was up against a powerhouse in the form of Costa. 
The fight would be everything the fans expected. It was a bloody affair. Streams of scarlet soaked both competitors in one of the most gruesome bouts to grace the octagon. Covered in crimson, Paolo Costa would have his hand raised in a unanimous decision victory, and Luke Rockhold, satisfied with his career in mixed martial arts and coming to terms with his age, would bow out of the sport the UFC releasing him from his contract. Costa had finally returned to the win column and was undoubtedly looking forward to another title run at middleweight. But in an age of fighter pay, Costa would once again rob the UFC brass the wrong way. I just had a, I just had a situation recently, and it was, it, I'll tell you who it was, it was Paulo Costa, mm -hmm. okay? He, he's a fucking lunatic, he acts like a lunatic, and uh, he came out publicly, said what we, what we offered him. Yeah. It was the furthest fucking thing from the truth. Costa had begun to feel somewhat disenfranchised by the organisation that he had bled for, with the rise of freak show fights featuring social media giants who in turn received large amounts of cash for their efforts. Costa had questioned what he was truly worth. Considering the fact that he felt he was one of the most talented combat athletes in the world, you can probably empathise with a man who proportionately gets paid a pittance compared to men who really have no talent or skill. It's a mockery of those men who put their bodies on the line for our entertainment, but the fact is Dana White and the UFC does not determine what people consider entertainment, and so Costa's escapade into getting more money might have been a fruitless task. And considering the cancelled bouts over the years that often could be boiled down to pay disputes, it's hard to imagine that Paolo came out on top going against his employers. And if there is anyone that probably deserves to get paid, it's the bloodbath of entertainment that is the eraser. It's funny to me though that as things start to trend downward for athletes or they attain their goal, discussions and thoughts quickly turn to money. Costa entered the UFC without a care in the world for how much he was going going to get paid. And now rudderless and his goal ever so distant, he has lost so many years of his prime in disputes with the UFC. Either way, it seems to be resolved now, and he can now focus on getting back towards the title that he coveted so much. For me though, Costa's story will stand for so much more by the end of his career than the brief decline that he has experienced just now. His story reminds us that, despite our own assertions that the path we take in life is graced by a divine power, that the fact is, successes, rich and high achievement are often not what allow us to grow as individuals. Belief in God, the universe, fate, or whatever you may call it, does not automatically mean that we are given the right to propel to the top. Costa's obsession with being champion, one that was fueled by a belief that he was destined to attain it, fractured and crumbled on the grandest stage on earth, humiliated in the culmination of a heated rivalry. The Costa we got back certainly was not the same. A personality shift, a breakdown in professionalism, and a loss of sense in regards to what he was worth to the UFC. The fact is, defeat and loss can do many things to an individual, particularly a fighter whose highs and lows are exposed to the world. Costa started his journey with the belief that it was God's design to see him in the UFC and ultimately to become champion. What would transpire instead was a cruel twist of fate. He reached the exact moment to achieve everything, an undefeated powerhouse, millimetres from attaining everything he was ever promised, and in an instance, he sabotaged everything. Instead of glory, he was delivered a bitter lesson, at the hands of a man who felt nothing is deserved, but earned. Costa's story to me will always be of how those lessons we speak are often dealt in ways that are humiliating and humbling in equal measures. From drinking a bottle of wine to get to sleep before the most important fight of his career, putting the onus on his opponent for his failed wake up, to the spectacle of his social media presence. One thing is for sure, Costa has made the middleweight division far more entertaining with his presence, and with his fighter pay resolved, I'm sure that we'll get many years of amusement to come. But the final notes of this story end in a rather direct way. What you feel you deserve, and what the world provides, are always two very different things. The only certainty is that the clock will continue to tick.